What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Ableton Music Producer Podcast. This is Dan Giffen. Today, I interviewed a new friend, Thomas Piper. He has worked with MTV. He's produced audio and video for Sesame Street. He has also worked with major artists like Public Enemy. It's pretty cool. Uh, Last Poets, many others. Today, we talk about his studio setup. We talk about a lot of random things, including his vocal chain for his live videos that he uses performing on the push too. We talk about things to consider before maybe an indie artist signs with a label. A lot of stuff in here today. Uh, before we jump in, I wanted to let you know, if you want to connect with me and a community of other experienced Ableton users and producers, I started a Discord community. So if you want to join that, I've got a bunch of channels set up on the left about mixing, mastering, Ableton hacks. Every week I'm posting new things I'm finding, tips and tricks, Max for live devices. So it's a good way to stay connected with me and in a community. And because Facebook only shows you the posts that Facebook wants to show you, I've found that the group has been limited in some ways. So I'm going all in on Discord. If you want to join the community and connect with other Ableton users and grow new brain cells, go to liveproducersonline.com slash Discord, D-I-S-C-O-R-D. Hit the button, you'll get a private link to this community. Love to see you in there. Join, hope to see you soon. Get involved, post in the community, share your tracks, blah, blah, blah. Also wanted to let you know, today's episode is sponsored by our friends from Melodics. So Melodics is a desktop app you can download. I think it's a great way for people to grow their skills playing on MIDI controllers, such as your MIDI piano keyboard, or whether you have a push and you want to step up your finger drumming, or maybe a launch pad. There's a lot of controllers that are easy. Plug and play has a huge lesson variety of different genres to help you step up your skills playing and performing. So go to Melodics.com, M-E-L-O-D-I-C cs.com and then use the discount code lpo-20 if you decide to take advantage of their subscription get 20 percent off they have a free trial so free trials are great check that out melodics.com also if you haven't upgraded to live 11 yet you are definitely missing out and i would be happy to hook you up with a discount and you can just go to liveproducersonline.com slash buy Ableton and you'll save some money. So that's if you want to purchase Live 11 for the first time. If you're upgrading from 10, then you probably are better off going to Ableton.com. Otherwise, I'm happy to hook you up. If you want to also stay connected with new podcast episodes when they come out. So I'll be releasing podcasts heads up every Tuesday, sometimes every other Tuesday. So check back on Tuesdays. Make sure you like, subscribe, hit that follow button wherever you're listening to your podcasts. And I would super appreciate it. If you want to be the first to know when episodes come out and I'll send you more cool stuff, you join the newsletter, liveproducersonline.com slash newsletter. That's enough promo. And now let's jump into today's episode with Thomas Piper. Up in your own t-shirt. Is it laundry day? <laughs> yeah, I'm rocking me today. No, I do that all the time, man. I'm always wearing my own shirts when I am low on laundry. <laughs> but yeah, we were just talking about your studio gear and setup. A Sub 37, a Matriarch. So I got two Moogs here. A Prophet 08 that's over there. Uh, you can't really see it. Yeah, I love um, Complete keyboard that's over there, which is kind of, they're both, I haven't really settled in on where to put them so I can reach to them. So I don't get a chance to use them like I, uh, well, the Prophet, I know what I'm using it for usually. Yeah. Um, and then I have a love that sound. Uh, 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 Apollo rack, Apollo that's there, and then a twin X that's here, and then under there you can't see it either. But I have a um the, um, the satellite. Oh yeah, um, I got the satellite. The satellite. Eight core. Yeah, I love that thing. Did you ever play with CV tools? Ableton CV tools. You ever mess with those? Yeah, that's why I got the um the twin X because my Apollo. I had the first generation Apollo rack. Okay. Right. So it's like a duo, nice. but it's like, you know, 16, uh, eight ins, eight outs, whatever. Yeah. So it doesn't do, you can't send CV out to it. Okay. But the twin X, you can. Nice. So I bought the twin. X. I used to have an older twin. I sold a twin to get the twin X so I could do the CV. So that's how I send CV out to, um, to the, the matriarch and to all that stuff. If I, you know, if I need to use CV tools or whatever. Right and on. then um, what else do I have? Yeah, so that's it. And I got a real Rhodes over here and a drum brood and yeah. a machine. Actually, your audio is going in to the machine right now. I'm using the machine as the audio interface. Yeah. You, sounds like you got a great family there, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got cool, you know, 
cool little thing going on here. <laughs> That's a good time. Yeah. And that Apollo twin is great for taking out on the streets and going on the road and stuff. Cause I know I've seen several of your videos of you just out on a street corner with a PA and you're just jamming on the push too. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I don't do it as much. I don't carry the Apollo anymore. So I just go out now. I just go auxiliary out from the computer. Nice. Um, but I, if I was doing, if I'm doing vocal looping, but I don't really, cause I'm usually just doing my songs. Yeah. And I find that if it's a loud place, the vocal looping is just records all the background noise. And- yeah. It's just weird. There's like slamming and behind you and yeah. And then that gets looped in it. And I just, I did it at first, but so, so once I didn't have to do the vocal looping, I just brought, I leave the Apollo for, if I'm doing some, some real stuff. And then I just, when I do a show, I just carry the computer and auxiliary jack and yeah. yeah. One less expensive thing to carry with you. Right on, man. Yeah. Well, for people who are listening right now who don't know you, I'll give you a proper introduction real quick and then we can just nerd out some more and talk. But uh yeah, for everybody listening, Mr. Thomas Piper, he's a Brooklyn based producer, vocalist, educator, push MIDI controller wizard. He runs a a, a music collective or label, I, I guess you would would you uh, yeah, it? I guess it's like a a label more the People's Republic of Sound. Yeah. People Republic of Sounds. Uh, you've been a featured artist on Ableton's website documentary series. Credits include working with MTV, Sesame Street, even, uh, and artists like yeah. uh, The Last Poets, Public Enemy, super dope, big fan. Yeah. That's really cool, man. I <laughs> I have to laugh because when I was reading like some of your credits, it was like MTV, Sesame Street, like two polar opposites. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I mean, you get called for. Or you get I love it. sucked into things that are different, you know. So you, you know, it's cool. You I did an Elmo remix once just for fun for my nephew for Christmas. Yeah. He was obsessed with Elmo. It was like seriously kind of concerning. Wow. So I ended up I just ended up writing a remix for him so my sister wouldn't go insane hearing the normal Elmo song five out of five a day. He loved it. It was like, but it was like, I put a bunch of Google images and spliced them together to a video that I made. And it, it goes from like this bouncy house Elmo remix to like this gangster, super hard, like Elmo rap. <laughs> oh, wow. Cool. My best work. Yeah. If you want to forward that to Sesame Street, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're oh. cool. I, they, they, they're cool. They, I, I did stuff for their uh, web channel. It's called Sesame Studios. So and we actually shot the video too. So it was an all in one thing. So it was like music and video. Yeah. So we had a bunch of kids. And I saw it, man. It looked great. And the yeah. and you composed the music for it, all of it, or did you collaborate with some other people? No, no, no. I did everything. So I did, yeah, I did everything. Actually, the lyrics and everything that you wrote for that, like the words, everything. It was just really yeah. catchy. Yeah. It was. It was great. It was great. Yeah, I had a little help with just making sure it stayed in the. Uh, educational realm because um terry my manager used to be an educator <laughs> so so she was able to just kind of go okay does this work so that was cool and then we shot the video uh i directed the video too it was it was a cool a cool endeavor cool endeavor well yeah i mean yeah tell us a little bit about your musical background like how did that lead you into the wonderful world of ableton that you're in now how did I get into the music from where? Like how far you want to go back? <laughs> as far back as you want to go, man. Like, I mean, know you're in Brooklyn. Did you grow up in Brooklyn? No, I grew up. I was born. I was born in, well, I was born in Manhattan technically, but I guess I was born in Brooklyn, but I, my parents moved to Long Island. Yeah. So I grew up in Uniondale, Long Island. Right on. Um, so it's a cool little neighborhood. It's like a um, mostly Caribbean neighborhood. Like after and you know it's mixed too. It's got like it's like white, but a lot of Caribbean. Yeah, mostly, mostly like seven eighty percent black, probably seventy percent. And it's different now. Now it's mixed. It's like more. It's like black Latino now. It changes. Yeah. But when I was growing up, most of my my friends were like kids who were of Caribbean descent, like Jamaican, uh, Trinidad stuff like that, and in, and an African American as well. Yeah. And um, yeah, so that that uh, so that's where I grew up um, and I took uh, piano lessons, that kind of thing. Um, I actually took piano lessons at first in, when I was in in Brooklyn in a place, Queens. So I was young, I was like three or something like that. And then um, guitar lessons a little bit, drums for a while. I took drums for a while. 
And then I was in the school choir for all of junior high school and all of high school. Yeah, you have a great voice, by the way. Thanks. Yeah, uh, so I, yeah, that that was cool. So I did that. Nice, man. So you definitely had a musical family thing going up. Yeah, and then professionally, because I'm in Long Island, I knew the Public Enemy people, so I knew like Hank Shockley, and because they weren't too far from me. So, um, but I was able to do like production. I did this group, Son of Berserks. It never came out though. Album. I was super young too. Um, like really young. And then, um, great names still though. I mean, public enemy, those, those cats changed culture, man. They changed the hip hop culture forever. Like, yeah, I grew up in that whole, like around the same neighborhood as them. So I knew them. Um, so it wasn't like too hard to run into them if you did music, you know? Yeah. It's cool. Cause the neighborhood is not, it's, it's, it's not true. It's like, you know, it's not, not everybody's a creative. Like I live in Brooklyn and like everybody's a creative, but, um, especially now. It's true. And, um, you know, Public Enemy was from like Roosevelt, but they had a studio in Hempstead, which is right next door. Um, Leader on Buster Rhymes is there. Yeah. And then, you know, um, Eddie Murphy was still around here and there because um, he grew up in Roosevelt. So that whole, it was a lot, there was a creative set, but they, they when you, you know, it's when you live in the suburb of New York, you got to, everybody would then leave and go to New York. Yeah. A lot of people who you think are like New Yorkers or some, a lot of them are really like from Long Island or, you know what I mean? They grew up in the suburbs. Yeah. So, so yeah. So anyway, so I knew that. And then, so that's when I first started doing stuff. And I, you know, this was, it might be pre daw This is definitely pre daw So it's like, you know, hardware samplers, mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. What was like some of the samplers, like before the DAW that you were getting into? I had, the first thing I had was a Roland S10. Nice. That was the first sampler. The, the first synth I had was a DX100, a Yamaha. Okay. I had a drum machine, an RX21. Nice. So those were the first, but then like the first professional thingy, really, because it's rolling the S, the, um, the S950 was the first sampler. Cool. That, um, I thought that professional sampler I had. The S10 was cool, but only could do like, I don't know, eight seconds. It was a rolling. It's professional, but. And we had to work really hard to get something yeah. on it. It's um, OG professional. Yeah. Then I got the first professional synth I got to me. Well, the DX100 was, is professional, but man, it's hard. It was hard to do all that FM stuff. And then I got an SY77. That was cool. And then the S950 was really the thing I used a lot for a long time. And I had it hooked up to a Mac running master tracks. So I didn't have a, I, ha, I didn't have like an external, I had a, a, a Mac sequencer yeah, um, as, as a sequencer. So that was like the old school setup, S950 Mac. Yeah. How did you get into Ableton? Like from that point? I, I bounced around. I had like Pro Tools and then I had um, Logic. Ableton, a friend of mine, um, my man, Randy, he run, runs a studio in um, Six Strings Studio, I think it's called. And he was like, I think it was him. And he was like, it's like able, it's gotta be like able to two or three. It was really early. Yeah. And, and he gave me, a, a, I guess the sample, he gave me the disc. I don't know how he got the disc. It was in a little envelope, a little yellow, um, greenish envelope. This is when Ableton was like green all the time. It had the little green logo. Or arrangement view, wasn't it? Like back then? Yeah, it was early. Man, that's and, awesome. and so he gave me that. And he was like, he's like, yo, I think you would like this. It, it's like, you, you know what I mean? Because you're always changing. I think you'd like this. It's the gateway. That's how yeah, you- so I was like, all right, cool. So he gave it to me and I put it on the computer and he wasn't even using it, which is the irony of it, right? And I was like, oh, this is crazy. So I could like, because, it, it, you know, I was doing time stretching and different things like using recycle, using all this other stuff. But this thing, it was like, oh, I got it real quick. I was like, yeah, this is great. So I was doing all my sample things in Ableton. So I run, I would run Logic for everything else. But if I had to make a track that had samples, I would use, I would use Ableton or if I needed to move samples around. And then I would record everything into Logic. So I would, I would either bounce it or rewire or whatever like that. Yeah, yeah. And then, so I was using it for a while. And then eventually, one day, I just was getting 
tired of going to logic and bouncing and kind of files moving around. You might misplace a file or, you know, or if you switch computers, you'd have to make sure you had both, you know, both. And it just was a mess. So I said, I'm just going to stay in Ableton. I'll just stay here. You know what I mean? I'll do everything here. Yeah. I don't know when, what version that was, maybe eight. Okay. That's when I got in. Yeah. It was an eight. Back in the day, yeah. at Dubspot, actually, I lived in uh, down the street from you probably for like a year. Yeah, I spent a lot, of, fair amount of time. All my friends lived in Brooklyn, but I lived in Manhattan down the street from Dubspot, which I don't know. Did you ever go there? Did you ever do anything? There? I uh, who used to run it? I used to run into a couple of people from there. Yeah, yeah, it was a cool spot. I knew people hung out. Um, I knew Hank used to go there, so I would, every once in a while I hang out with Hank Shockley there. Go there, but um, yeah. So that I think it was like eight, eight or nine, or I, you know, I was using it, yeah. but I wasn't using it for everything. And the eight or nine, I was just like, I'm using it for everything. I'm not leaving. You know, I'm just going to stay. And, um, and I would probably, and then I would rewire reason. And um, yeah. And, that, and then from there on in, I've been mainly Ableton and, you know, nothing else. I mean, I still have logic on the computer. Um, I use reason a lot more now because it's inside the, um, you can use it as a VST AU. Yeah. So I use, so I'm back to reason again, um, but in Ableton. Right on. And then, uh, and then over the years, I started knowing people at Ableton too. Right on. Yeah. It's a great kind of great company, man. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the video that you were featured in their documentary series and like, you're a madman on the push too. Like it was great. Yeah. Yeah, tear that up, man. It was really, really fun to see you doing some of your performances and stuff. I was, uh, I was trolling you on YouTube earlier, but yeah, I mean, you, you do a Friday series called beat design, which is yeah. every, you just make up something on the spot every Friday and then you just live stream it out for the world. And, uh, yeah, I mean, most of the time it comes out good. Sometimes it's like, eh. but, um, yeah, <laughs> but I mean, this week, this week's was really good. This week was great. There's one episode one forty one or something. It is yeah. that at these, you know, um, sometimes I'll do them back to back. So I might do two. So I might do like, if I'm in the studio and I feel like, and we're on a roll, like, Ooh, that one came out great. Let's make just do something else. Yeah. So we'll do two. So I actually had back to back. So I, I just separated the two. So these next, this one and the next one are, are actually really good. Very disco-y, Anderson Packy kind of four on the floor thingies. Oh, man. Back. Yeah. So, but yeah, so I've been doing beat design for a minute, for a minute, for a minute, for a minute. For yeah. A couple well, of years, I think. It shows, man, for sure. Did you mess with the push one or did you just yeah jump? if you look at my early beat designs it's push, push one okay right on and yeah, then I mean, um two different controllers in my mind really yeah i mean they feel different yeah um i don't remember push one anymore <laughs> because i got push one right away and then i was there for the able to able to have like an unveiling for push two yeah, like both for like a you know they have like you know little unveiling like a group of people they unveil it to a little ahead of time. So I saw push two ahead. Yeah. So I had push two early too, but by that point, so but by that point they knew because I I think my early beat designs were push one because I was the whole grid thing I was already kind of into I was already like first it was the APC then I and um then I was running then I was going to buy Monom to do like MLR. Then I then I had Launchpad that I used MLR with this kind of hack thingy. Mm, yeah. Like when I'm traveling, right before the pandemic, I went to see my parents because they they were in Trinidad. I carry a Launchpad. I don't carry the push, yeah. you know, because it's just smaller. So I have the new I have the new Launchpad Pro, and I have the old Launchpad Pro. Right on. And then um and um, so yeah so I'm into the grid thing so yeah yeah yeah. Um, for these beat design videos you do every Friday. What does your process look like as far as setting up like your Ableton template before you just go and start improvising on the spot? Uh, I try to keep it simple and I, and I keep it like genre specific, like maybe like episode 140 of this month or 139 or whatever. It was more like a a Brooklyn drill thing because I'm, I'm in bed so I hear that all the time out here. Mm. The, the record that's kind of inspired all that Brooklyn drill stuff is Gun Lean which is a record from England, like gun lean, man, gun lean. That's actually, it's, it's the record that they kind of copied. Yeah. So like, I, so I might have a template for that. So like, so what I'll do is I have a drum kit with the snare, the right kicks and snares that sound like that. 
808. Do you build drum racks around these genres? I usually have drum racks already set up for what I'm doing. So I got like a trap drum rack. I have like, I, I used to sell this thing called trap pack too, where I had trap sounds. So I have all my trap sounds there. I have certain sounds like a soul sounds. Mm-hmm. Um, for this album, I'm doing a lot. Like this next album's coming. I have like, I'm doing a lot of like, 70s kind of records nice. so it's got like this kind of 70s singer songwriter thing so i have sounds for that cool. and um when i do the beat design i'll have maybe six sounds there um a drum rack and then like a bass sound usually like a sub lab 808 nice um if it's like something like a drill thing some keyboard thingy like a pluck or a piano or, you know some yeah. spacey sound Stuff like that. If it's like this episode that I did, 141, it was more disco. So it had like some live sounding drums. Those mm-hmm. are more like some contact drum library thing, like a, from, you know, from complete. I have a like complete ultimate or whatever. So I have like a live drum set. It's, you know, 70s drum set, 60s drum set, whatever. Tune yeah. the drums to kind of sound like, you know, whatever they used in the 70s. Then I'll have like a bass line, a bass sound. Because this, this one's more acoustic, so I'm going to have like an acoustic bass. I have a Rhodes. What bass did you use in your recent one? Because that sounded thick. That was nice. It's just in a, you know, one of those acoustic basses from like complete. But then you go in there and then you... But the beauty of it is... And then you EQ everything. Yeah. Yeah. So you go in there and then you just... You know, you do your research. You travel. You figure out, okay, this is this record is... I want this sound. It kind of sounds like, especially with those records, there's enough information that you could be like, okay, they use 1176. Okay. They recorded on a studio. Okay. They use, you know what I mean? You just follow their path mm-hmm. down. Yeah. And then, and so you get it to sound the way there's tons of bass sounds that sound good. They usually just dry and sound like shit in the machine. But then when you play them, process them a little bit once you you know you follow the, the path mm-hmm. uh, there's so much resources like you know you, you go on old mix magazines on the internet especially for the old stuff you know what i mean you can you can get your stuff disclosures website i they have some nice bass lines because they're doing that kind of disco 70 thing too yeah. but then they thump it up with extra kicks and snares and stuff like that mm-hmm. so um yeah so I, I i watch their things every once in a while and see what they're doing Okay. So I go in. So, so when I'm recording, I'm just concerned about chord structure, you know, melody, get something that sounds good, yeah. you know, and just and try to do, you know, and just play. Yeah, you can tell you have fun when you're playing, like, too. Like, I think that's important. Just like feeling the energy and the vibe. Like, yeah, you're doing like you really get in it. Um, and like, that's a good walkthrough as far as like your your processing with like your sound design and stuff. What's up, everybody? Just wanted to take this time to give you a quick reminder to check out Melodics.com, that desktop app I keep talking about. It's definitely worth it. There's a free trial, but it's a great way to just improve your finger drumming or playing scales, or you can also plug in your electric drum kit, which I've done, it's kind of fun, and you can just practice playing drums that way. So it's like a better version of Guitar Hero. It's a fun way to practice. Go to Melodics.com. Also use the discount code LPO-20, save that 20% because we love to save that money. Also wanted to give you a quick reminder, if you want to join me and hang out with a community of other Ableton users, grow new brain cells, and you have questions, maybe you need some support or just want to find out what's the best way to do X, Y, and Z, join the community in Discord. Go to liveproducersonline.com slash Discord. You'll get a private link to join the community, and I would love to see you in there. Liveproducersonline.com slash Discord. And now back to today's podcast. I'd love to, to get to know, and I'm sure people listening right now would love to get to know kind of your process with the performing aspect of the push too. So it was like, I like how you go about with like your looping on the push. And obviously it'd be perfect if we could see, if everybody could see like how you're doing on the push, like a proper webinar, but this is a podcast. So I may be to the best that you can explain kind of what you're doing while you're performing with the I mean, it, what, it, It's real simple. I mean, I'm not going too crazy. The hardest thing is just playing, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And then the, what sounds you want to use. And then because it's video, it's not a live stream. I don't have to worry about all of that's being recorded. So usually I would hit the record button and then just loop and go. So it just gets recorded straight. And then, um, so after I, re- I would, yeah, record it, 
keep it going straight and just loop, loop, loop. I'd probably have the loop set to a certain bar, but I would change them as I'm going on. So sometimes you'll see me, I'll just change it. If it's a drum loop, maybe I'll just go two bars, four bars, whatever. Really yeah. simple. The key is just knowing what you want to put together, right? Because yeah. the looping part is, it, it's already set up to loop. I mean, it's just there. That's kind of how I make a beat too. So mm-hmm. I just loop a beat and, and then, you know, if I get a, a song idea right then and there, and then I just get the vocals, I'm right there, I run to the vocals, I, I, I get the vocal down. What I tell some of my students too a lot is to just be able to have a good library of your presets and sounds already saved so that when you do feel inspired, like when you're jumping on that push, like everything's ready to go. You yeah. Know, when yeah, I, I mean, sometimes it depends on your mood too. Like sometimes I may have something in my head already. So like, like, like for instance, this album that I'm doing now for that's coming out later on, I know the vibe of the album. I know what sounds I'm going to use. It's very acoustic sounding. It's going to be, you know what I mean? Whereas this, there's Permission to Live, the album that's out now, there was more experimentation with sounds here and there. It had some things that had soul like that I knew. And then there was some things like I aim higher where it was just like, let me go through these contact sounds and see what hits me. Eh, no, eh, no, eh, no. Eh. And I just went through. Oh, once I had that, then it was like, okay, what drums might go to this? Boom. So it depends. You know, if I'm doing an R&B record and it's like a, soul record i may know okay i'm using roads i'm using that so i have my favorites click 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 i go through that then the key to me is more about okay well what's the chord progression what's the song like you know what i mean like the beat design it's more like okay i have to have all these things nobody wants to see me go through sounds <laughs> yeah just nope 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 but i but i still want to be able to um i still want to be able to have a little leeway so that's where pian- a piano sound might work better, where, you know, you could do with a piano, you may be able to do different genres if you wanted to. A Rhodes, you, you can't lose with the Rhodes. You know, it's going to be like, right. this is what's going to work. A, a guitar sound, that's, you know, that might work, you know, simple, simple drums. Um, electronic music, trap is easy, right? It's just like, okay, you need, you just need something going boom, 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 something that kind of has that kind of rhythmic triplet thing going on at the top. Yeah. 808 at the bottom, kick snare. I feel like the push is like gold for people who make trap music with hi hats because you can just hold down the repeat button and then yeah that's it reminds me of a, a, a MPC where you just I used to have one of those too you have an MPC you could just do repeats yeah and stuff like that but I think the the strength of the, the push to me is still more the I think is the melodic part the harmonic really the harmonic part I mean that's the strength so how- that's that's the that's the secret sauce to me there's other machines that are better for beats I think machine is better for beats but overall the push does all of those things better uh, good like right so it's yeah piano's really good but it's big right so that that's one of the problems but it's great at doing especially melody lines right the, the push can do that machine is great it's got those big pads right but that's it's another device it's not really good at melodic things yeah. it's horrible at harmonic things like chords and stuff like that and with the push too, you can lock it into scale. For people who don't have a lot of music theory, it's really easy to play in key. Right, you can play in key. Well, you could do that with other things too. Yeah. Um, but um, I don't it know just the level is the push, right? Well, you know what? The, because the push is essentially a three or four octave keyboard. That that's the key. That's what attracted me to the push. I mean, and some other things. I mean, the way that the push is set up in in fourths. Yeah. So because it's set up in fourths, it's a lot like. Like um, what's his name? Like Stanley Jordan kind of thing, um, or yeah, I think Stanley Jordan, the guitarist. But yeah, but he does the hammer on thing, right? So his guitar is tuned in force, and because it's tuned in force, it allows him to just hammer on. He learns shapes, so you know, so it's easy for him to yeah. to um to do chords on his guitar without having to really strum because things will just line up and this works is essentially the same mm-hmm. so that's the strength of the push harmonically you know what i mean it, 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 it's what makes the push better than everything else it's like you know especially when you're in chromatic mode i don't use the other mode at all but and maybe because i do a lot of jazz so i might i might so i might do a little like a that's like a, a scale right yeah it, it essentially would be out of the key here. This yeah. note would be out of key. So if I put it in key, I would lose that note. Uh, so yeah. I wouldn't be able to. I wouldn't be able to do that if I kept it in key. Right. 
or you know, or songs where you, like you know, like you couldn't play a Stevie Wonder song on the push if it was in key. No, because you he goes out of key all the time. Like he, he does, you know, modulations and all this other stuff and yeah, modal interchange and all this other shit. So it's no wrong notes in jazz, right? Just well, they they know how to go out. They know how to go out. They they yeah. it's like classical music. They know when to go out. There's there's a lot of modal interchange where you're going out with relatives of, of other, you know what I mean? So yeah. you, you know, okay, this chord can go out after I play this chord. So, cause those guys are most of those jazz musicians, especially bebop dudes, they're trained. You know what I mean? Like Miles Davis is like, you know, Juilliard, you know, <laughs> like next level. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So th- those guys, they know. So, so you can go out of mm-hmm. key, but it won't, it's not out of key. Yeah. If that makes sense. Right. But it's also a great way to learn theory because right. yes. because you understand things, right? So like, unlike a piano, the muscle memory is a little less for certain things. The tuning of the, the push being in force, mm-hmm. you see it. Mm-hmm. You don't see it on a piano. Most electronic musicians, they have two instruments in front of them. They've got a 16 pad thing and a piano. Mm-hmm. So when they try to learn music theory, they get frustrated because... Uh, a piano takes a lot of muscle memory to learn everything. Mm. Um, takes a lot of muscle memory to learn a scale. Dance, you yeah. know, the, the push you learn to scale one time. How many notes? Twelve notes. Twelve times. Yeah, yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? You learn to push scale one time. Yeah. That's it. And then you just move it. Whereas on a piano, you learn to scale. You've got a muscle memory to scale. Mm. So you've got to be like da 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 da, and then da 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 da. You gotta physically know where it is. So when you want to improvise and jump into different things, it's way harder. The push is different. That's the beauty of the push that a lot of people don't see. Yeah. That is the that's the only reason why I use a push. It's replaced my piano. It's like I don't use a piano. Yeah. No, right? I have a beautiful keyboard in front of me, and I still use this push more than I do that for notes. <laughs> oh yeah, I don't use a piano at all. At all. I use the only one, the only piano sometimes I use is the sub 37 just because I want to turn the knob is already there. So I do it out of laziness. Mm-hmm. But um, so, yeah, so that's so that's the thing that I use. So, I mean, it takes a little practice, but and you, you can use like the chord MIDI effect if you want to hack it, too. You know, just hit one or two. Now. Right. The technology is actually in your favor with a device like the push. Mm-hmm. I'm a big push fan for the plane. I really am. And, I, you know, one day I might do a whole thing like a whole class but i'm so busy trying to knock out this stuff but well another part of your music obviously is vocals like you're right. a vocalist and you do a lot of cool vocals and layering and process mm-hmm. let's talk a little bit about that as well uh like what does your vocal chain look like as far as when you're recording into an apollo twin most of the time right yes i used to but yeah i don't know if you can see the setup here but yeah. it's just so hard to unplug all this crap <laughs> Yeah, because the Mac Pro is hooked up to the thing and the Apollo's hooked up to the display and da, 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 da. so yeah. So what I do is so I use the machine. The Apollo was better though. Apollo was better because the Apollo has low latency Pre-amp. monitoring. Yeah. So. Oh, nice. Yeah, but here's the thing about the preamps. Here's the thing. I'm still using a Shure 50, you know, whatever this is, 58. SM58, yeah. 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 <laughs> it's like eh. It's, it's like uh, you know the music is playing in the background it's, it's like great you got the preamp and it sounds great if you're like but the reality is by the time it gets processed anyway it doesn't really or matter like thinking like well you know he's not using that like 610b today like you know <laughs> yeah and for me like i'm my the, my main mic i have a sh- the slate digital mic oh no nice. you like that i've seen a lot of reviews yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. It's great. It's awesome. Yeah, because it's just modeling all these different microphones that you can choose in the software, right? But it's just... The pre-choice is irrelevant at this point, right? Because you don't... And then you just virtual your pre. That's why you just saturate to taste, right? And you check and you go through to taste. And, and certain mic models, they sound like a U6, U47 in real life is a little, little dark. But when you EQ it in real life, it sounds freaking amazing, right? Um, it's the same thing. If I'm going to do that, that will be going through the Apollo. That'll be going through high end stuff. But this is like the show. And the reality of the show is most venues sound like crap. <laughs> um, I used to have an SM7 and uh, I, I'm actually going to bring that back in. So I might bring that back in. 
Nice. And then there I might be a little more thing into that. But um yeah, so I just go into the with the machine. Okay. And then after that, the uh, do you have like a set chain that you normally use? Like no, because while I'm while I'm recording it is just straight, no nothing. Mm-hmm. Then when it's time to mix it. So remember, I'm just recording. It's like I'm just recording right. it all straight. No EQs, no nothing, none of that. I'm, I'm more concerned about making sure because two things, you know, I'm recording it for video. So anything that I put on there, if anything glitches, when I have to play it back because I'm recording it, it the, the computer's not going to play it back with any time glitch. If I'm doing it live, I may get a time glitch, right? Because you, every once in a while, you might get like, like a little, it's something, if you add a plug in or you add it. Yeah. So, computer's not real stable and you're running all these. Right. Things. I mean, it's computers. It hasn't happened often. It's happened once or twice. Right. Where they don't line up. Right. So yeah, I, a lot of plugins that can definitely happen with other. Right. So I keep all the plugins to a minimum on this end so that the, the sync between the video and Ableton is fine. Right. And then, so that whole thing is recorded. Yeah. So after it's recorded, like then I go in and I go, okay, I might have to clean up background noise. So that's one thing I'll do. And then it's just the basic, I have like a, um, the, uh, you know, the slate virtual rack thingy. Okay. It's probably a little lazy, but that's basic. Right. Yeah. But that's probably, that's, that's mainly it for vocals for me. Like it's usually that yeah. uh, the 1176, the LA two way, oh, you know, the same things that everybody's used for centuries. It seems like, right. Um, a Neve might pre maybe the, the it, if it's really bad, the fab or the infinity, um, yeah. if I got some issues and then reverbs, um, I have the, uh, UAD. Actually, I use three UADs. I, I go through all three. Uh, the one of the lexicon. I love the lexicon. Yeah, I know what you're talking. The, um, the EMT, depending yeah. on how, and the That's capital, awesome. the capital chambers. Yeah, yeah, that lexicon's nice. Yeah, the lexicon's nice. The capital chambers is really good if you're doing soul R and B. Okay. Because it's not so digital sounding. Yeah, it's got that warm. Yeah, it sounds like a chamber more. It actually is pretty good. So. I tend to use that one. So like if I was over a trap thingy, you might hear more of the lexicon, the EMT, cool. you know, that, that kind of vibe. So, yeah. so that, that's the chain. Real simple. I may not be able to compress as much because sometimes it has so much background noise because sometimes I'm turning up the back. I mean, I try to be conscious of it. So, you know, you might see me while I'm rec- recording and then I reach to turn down the volume when it's time to do the vocals. Yeah. You know, because I have one vocal came out horrible, but you know that's that, that's the chain. It's real simple. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't win them all, but I mean, most of your videos they sound awesome, man. All the ones I've heard, they're great. Yeah, they they sound okay sometimes. I mean, the early on, we used to just record straight. The early videos are literally straight to a recorder. Like the <laughs> first 60, 70 videos, those were Apollo. So it was coming from the Apollo straight into a little task cam recorder that we use for video. So that was like improv to the hilt. <laughs> That's like what you get is what you get. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. No mixing even. It's yeah. just a two track. Sometimes that rawness is nice though. You know, I feel like yeah. so, much, so much shit is just overproduced a lot. Like, it, you know what I mean? And I, I'm not saying that would be the preferred method for the future, obviously, but uh, you know what it is about it, that realness. Like, but here's the problem with that for live. It's that your levels, it, if anything is wrong with your levels, it's there. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? And it's yeah. like, and there were many videos where it was like, man, I wish this drum was bumping or man, this drum is too low. Or, oh, and it, because you got to do the prep work in advance to make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah, but it doesn't work that way. It always seems like it's going to work that way, especially with the live drums where you're kind of playing and your dynamic might change. Yeah, that's true. Or you're, or, or you might have too many vocals you start getting thing and your vocals got big and now you wish it could sit a different way you know you, you you can't change that you know what i mean and a lot of times it was straight improv sometimes you know you're in a rush i just was like this sound this sound this sound this sound this sound let's see what happens and and so they didn't match or, or anything and and you and i would change the sounds and um you can't see but on on the other side there's a pair of like big jbl um you know sh- live monitors yeah i have two jbl sitting up here too might be the yeah same. yeah i have the big you know the i don't know what they're called the um 
I, have, I think there's a, these are like the uh, ions or eons or something. Yeah, mine. I think mine's are eons. They like they're like black. Yeah, like yeah. Uh, so so like fifteen inches. Yeah, something like that. So they're they're on the other side facing me, right? So that's how I hear. Actually, that's how I'm hearing you too because I'm not coming out through the. Oh, you're getting like and full and PA stuff. blasted Dan right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're. That's why when you said when I got up and you was like, "Where, where are you going?" I was like, "Ooh, that turned this shit." Down. <laughs> it's, like, it's like this is God's figure. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. So they sometimes they are a little weird to to balance, especially I've gotten used to the Yamahas, and um, I have a pair of um, Adams over there too that I, I have to figure out how to set up in here because I just got the Focals. Is the so eights, trying, eights or HS eights and then the Focal, which is I use the Focal more than HS eights. I mean HS eights have two subs here, so I, I you know, but the Focals they're kind of good because they you could actually you don't really need a sub. Bro, we have the same setup. I have two Focals right now as well. I yeah. love Focals. Yeah, the Focals are cool, and then I have the A seven Xs that are over there that I'm gonna try to set up. I just haven't figured out how, and I have the sub the matching sub for the A seven X. That, Adam, yeah, yeah, yeah. Audio, they're a sponsor for the podcast. It's great. And yeah, I have the A7X, so I, I actually have to. Um, the, I took them down because I I must have blew the the sub. It's been bumping pretty hard. No, I have the. Um, I figured out what it was. I have this ARC, the I K Multimedia thingy, mm. that does the room correction. Oh, so what it does? So what happens? I guess in this room, the the room is it's not flat, right? So. And in the low end, what happens is it's turning down the, the sub is the base is low. So the, the IK multimedia is kicking up the sub. Oh, so you just really overcompensated that sub. And it just, well, I didn't overcompensate. It did. Oh, yeah, it did. Yeah, yeah. Right. It, so so it, it overcompensates. So you could. So so the sub is working, <laughs> but it doesn't feel loud. And you're just like more. And the sub. Well, not, it's just it's working harder than you would think it's working. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So your tops are like, no problem. Your tops are like, hey, this is easy. But the sub is like, it's right? And the room, and because remember, the room is sucking up the base. Yeah. So the room seems flat. Mm-hmm. Right. So to me, it's not booming because in the sweet spot, it's yeah, perfect. sounds good. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the sub is working hard. So when you if you get to a level where it would be right normally good, the sub is just working like crazy. And I figured that out. I was like, oh, it's this stupid thing. So um, so it blew the sub. Oh no, I'm sorry. Yeah, so I have to replace the sub. So I so that so once I replace it, I'll get it fixed, whatever it costs to fix it. Yeah. And I just can't listen to the A7X without the sub. They're little, they're bright. So man, Adam the sub. Adam makes some really good like high-end monitors. Like they make some really good stuff. No, they're great. I mean, that whole system cost me like three grand, yeah. but it's just and they're they're accurate. They're a little forward though, but they're accurate. It's it's a it's a quiet taste, but it, it's it's it it it's it, it. I'd rather have honest speakers than I would just speakers that always kind of sound good. Like you yeah, know, what I, I mean, for what I do like mixing, I want it to be tell me if something's weird or not. Yeah, but even even for flat, like okay, after you put the room correction, the atoms still have a forward thing. Mm. So it's still flat, but they all sound different. Like, yeah. so after they're corrected, they still like the atoms are a little forward. Yeah. I've had that same thing with, after I had my room treated by Dennis Foley, who's like a brilliant guy. He's worked with like Capitol records and other, right. and he built these, uh, acoustic diaphragmatic absorbers. I think they're called like, I noticed the bass popped out a lot more when I got them, but it's still like the mid range, I feel like is really in my face, and I feel like the sub sometimes gets tucked away a little bit after it's been treated. But those are just the monitors. Yeah, I, they're all different, right? So I think it's all good different. to know your monitor, no matter who you are. I think it just yeah. I still end up in the car, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, Hard you know, time. five thousand dollars of monitors or six hundred much more monitors, and I still end up in the I car like. <laughs> Here you go. That's what it is. That sounds good. That sounds bad. This sounds good. This sounds so bad. True. Okay. I think Sony Records don't they have like a car on uh, cinder blocks in like the basement of the studio or something just for the engineers to go down and test it in the car. I don't know why I, the car I is. That. I heard is that. the reality check of all reality checks. It's like 
it's like the final moment of truth in every engineer's life when they go to me like yeah and not even that like now for me i actually almost only listen to music in my car like unless i'm out and and about right which doesn't happen as much with this covid stuff but like the car is my preferred place to listen to. Yeah. I have a I have a Toyota Prius with a with a nice JBL system. It was like it has a sub. It actually rocks, and it's like you know you can listen to your mix and know oh the sub's too loud, all oh, the things too loud. I'm just imagining this Prius rolling through Brooklyn with like this huge like sub speaker just bumping. Like- no, it's not it's not crazy, but it's it's like this factory system. But it was like the factory system upgrade. So it was like the upgrade, right? Yeah. So it's, so it's still tuned properly, yeah. right? But it has a sub and you know, it has a sub and you can hear where everything is. Like you, the minute you get in there, you play something, especially the low end. Cause I don't have too much problem with the high end and the mids. I mean, I have to work the mids cause you know, you always got to be careful with your mids. Sure. Right. Once you get the mids, right. Everything else doesn't really matter but still the sub you know okay this is this is popping it it yeah. works and it's yeah. so much easier i mean these monitors have gotten better the room and i haven't gotten the room treated yet cuz i still have video stuff to do in the room mm-hmm. so it 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 does a double duty yeah so it's like you know i like it white so i get as much light in here yeah so that i could you well, know i don't have to always in the daytime i don't need lights you know i don't have to light the room i could just use natural light yeah, I prefer just to be in a dark cave pretty much most of the time, just in my little studio corner. Yeah, I can't do that because we do video stuff. Sometimes I have, like I have a green That's screen true. for stuff that we're doing green screen. Yeah. So I can literally light it. I can light something with natural light in here. That's nice. It was a whole time I, all I was doing was going to studios. I had, I had a publishing deal with Universal. All I was doing was going to studios. And they were all dark. <laughs> I didn't know what time it was. Yeah. You'd come in the day, it'd be dark. You'd leave in the night, it'd be light. Yeah, it smells like cigarettes and coffee. I just, I, <laughs> you know, and I would go to these graphic designers places. And this is like the 2000s, maybe. And it would be so bright in there. And it'd have like, it just looks so nice. The Cabouzier yeah. type shit, like modern, you know, 50s, 60s, um, and they'd have that kind of vibe going in there and be bright. And I'd be like, man, listen, this studio, shit, this studio looks like a dungeon. It stinks. I hate these places. So when it came to do my place, I wanted my place to be like brighter yeah. and have a vibe and have plants. And I love plants, man. Yeah, I I've like got plants at my window. You can't see it, but I have plants in the window. I have plants, yeah. Um, I've got a bunch of stuff here. My girl usually picks them up. Have you named your plants? The only one I have is the money tree name. It's called root beer because you got to put ice in it. <laughs> so, so that's where instead of putting water, you put ice in it. So I call it root beer. That's the only one that has a name. It was the first plant too. So the first plant got a name. It's called root beer. It's been here for like three, four years, four or five years. The first one, you got that sentimental value. Yeah, yeah. the first one got a name. First one was like root beer. It's got a because you put ice in it. I was like, oh, we call it root beer. So, so yeah, so that one has one, um, has like, it's a money tree too. Right on. That's the one I, that's my baby. That's the one I like. I mean, I, I, I take care of them all, but I love root beer. I like to think that my plants can hear me talk to them sometimes. Like sometimes I do. I just like the fact that they're there and they're giving some air and it's just like. Just alive. It's happy. Yeah. And you're not in the studio, you know, it was cute when I was kid and you know, and you walked in as the SSL and all the vintage shit. And you're like, yeah. And then after a while, it was just like, so? <laughs> like, so? <laughs> like, yeah. especially with the door thing where the stuff that you were doing at home was coming out better than the stuff that you do in a studio because you only had so much time there. Yeah. And it just was like, and I had too many... Yeah. Um, it's expensive to rent big studios like that now. Yeah, but also you go to the home. studio and the vibe would change. So, and, and you know, you go in the studio, you make the record at home, right? Record company call you to do something, or you knew somebody, you're going to record and come going home. And then you come to the studio, and then the record's not the same record anymore. Mm. There were a couple of instances where it was better, but a lot of times that specialness that was in what they used to call the demo, mm. which doesn't exist anymore, thank God, <laughs> was there. So, I 
I was an early DAW Pro Tools, stay home, yeah. do as much as I can, give an engineer as much as I gave them with levels and all that stuff, guy. You know what I mean? Because once it got, and then, because once it got to the studio, it would change. And, and that has to do, and, you know, because it just became this thing. So when you leave the studio and then you get to your car and you're like, what is this crap? Why yeah. does this thing sound so bad? Yeah. And, and it just was, I think a lot of times of that. Now, some people love the studio. I think for them, it's great. They, they, they could work in a, a recording studio. I mean, I haven't stepped foot in the studio because there's no need to. I think exactly. Like for somebody like you and me, we know how to produce on our own. But I think for musicians, somebody who's just a guitarist, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're going to need to be in a place. Yeah, for them. Oh, yeah. if you're doing film, I think and you've got an orchestra, a big band, and you need right. a certain sound. You know, or even, you know, certain rock bands, depending on what they have. I mean, you know, I see these guys in Nashville. They got everything in their crib, but, um, you know, they got like, you know, you know, vintage everything. It's my living room with my SSL. Man, they got APIs and I mean, they got real shit. I see some shit, you know, that, you know, motherfuckers have in their house. And you're like, why you could do fucking fucking Neil Young record in a motherfucker. Yeah. Um, and they got everything. So even them, they're like, Hey, I just go on vintage kid. I just buy all the stuff. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's what they do. Well, I think that's like a good segue into talking about one thing I saw on the Ableton blog when they were featuring you as an artist, they asked a couple questions that I would love for you to answer again. What does it mean to be an independent musician today? Cause you were talking about like being in video and being a producer and being an engineer you know, I feel like a lot of artists have to wear a lot of hats today. What was, What is your answer to that as far as being an independent musician today? Like, do you have to wear a lot of hats? What does that look like to be successful? When I did the Ableton thing, I would have one answer. This, the answers changed not because of the music part. I was already pretty much a self-contained production facility, even when I was in the music business, right? So some of the problem was maybe a, more of the stuff should have been in house, right? It's not for everybody, but the thing that makes it a little tough is the business end. We're we're a two person team. It's me and, and and Terry, and we have to do marketing. We have to do like this record. We might have spent you know a couple of thousand dollars on marketing. Yeah, we hire publicists for a certain thing. If when you're on a record label, you don't do that. Right. So I've been in both. I've been, I had a publishing deal. I've had records out. I've been on the road through a label, all that. I've been on a, I've been, I did a Mel LaRue where they were an independent group. So they, she used to be in this band, used to this thing called Groove Theory. And now she does, she had her own thing, right? They start their own label. So I've been, I've worked for someone who actually was indie. So, and then I've done indie myself. The big difference with a record company and indie is that a record company you get your you get a loan at the beginning. So if you're not careful, you don't know where your money, what your money is. So there's this idea that you're gonna always get money, but you're not really making money, you're really getting a loan that you've got to pay back. And so what happens to most musicians is like, and it happened to me a little bit too, is like after that is done, you have no money because you're always thinking, you're always kind of outstretching for more. Whereas when you're indie, you're always spending money. Right. So when you make money, you're like, ooh, what am I going to do with this money? Because you know, if I blow this money, I've got to spend more money to get more money. When you get $500, $1,000, you are way more responsible with that money because you know that you spent blah, blah, blah. And the reality, like this album that we've done, we've, we've spent more money. We'll use an internet analogy. Our runway, you need, you need some runway. So, and I think that's the thing that a lot of us don't know. Like I, so like I've been reading this book, um, Unfair Advantage it's called, and you got to figure out your unfair advantages to kind of be successful or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's a really good book, actually. Yeah. That sounds like a good book. Yeah. It's called the, uh, the uh, I think it's the unfair advantage or unfair advantage. Specifically about music or is it just about. No, it's more like, it's more about business. Cause that's the thing. Yeah. You realize that. When, when you were labeled, you kind of more about, well, I'm going to make this record and this record's going to be less. And you're kind of fighting the label for, well, I think this song should work. And, you, and when you're indie, you're looking at it like, okay, 
this song, is this song working? <laughs> yeah. And you're, and you, and you look at your metrics and you're going to doing the same thing a label does. And you're going, well, maybe we should push this song. Cause this song is okay. The same thing that the label was doing to, to you, mm-hmm. you do to yourself. Yeah. I think there's a lot of a huge attraction to labels uh, from independent artists because of the marketing power. You know, like for me, I look at myself as an independent musician and it's like, it takes so much time. Like, you know, right. Post on social media to grow like a fan base to like, no, you really got to become uh, content all the time. You can't do it yourself. You can't do it yourself. You can't do it yourself. I mean, you can, you can do it yourself, but it helps have a team. Yeah. Helps have a team, even if it's just two other people, one other person. And then, and then, but you'll know though, at first I didn't feel I needed a team. Now it's like, oh, I need Terry needed to jump in. Now it's like, oh, I think we need a publicist. Oh, I think we need this. Yeah. You know? So, you know, you do all this work and you've got like, you know, 40,000 plays and you're like, oh, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so, you know, you, you know, so you've got to really, you know, and you're trying and you do your math and it's like, oh, I got to, I've got to move to zero three, which means, man, I got to get like a million plays to make some money. Mm-hmm. If it's just plays, because especially now you're not doing shows or, or you get your Google AdSense from your videos. Mm-hmm. So those are the things I think the difference is the, for me, the big difference is, oh, money's coming later and you've got to spend money and you've got to be consistent on that. And you've got to it's not just doing the music. So hopefully you're good enough with the music that you can do the music, move on and spend all this energy Facebook did an automate, you know, my Instagram is automated, create a studio, you know, things like that. So that, you know, you know, beat designs are being done ahead so that we're not, you know, usually I would just do my beat design on Friday, same day, knock it out, came out crappy, who cares? But now I can't even do that. I have to like, okay, beat design has to be done ahead of time. This has to be done at a time. Yeah. I'm already working on the next record. That has to be done ready. Uh, Video has to be prepped and planned. You can't just put out something today because nobody knows. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. So that's the difference. But I wouldn't do a deal though. So why wouldn't you do a deal? Let me ask you that. Uh, I think if you're self-contained and you do a deal, now there's always a deal. Everybody, there's always everybody got their price. <laughs> I wouldn't do do a deal unless I had some sort of ownership of masters yeah. because I'm gonna come to it with one, right? And I would be more like an MBA deal where I have a free agent, mm-hmm. which they don't do. And that's my problem with record deals. Like I'm, every option is on their part. I mean, once we get technical, you know, their options almost every day. I've never seen a deal, a couple of deals where you're free. And, and in my case, I'm more like a basketball. I'm even, I would say we bring more to the table than a basketball player. Basketball plays a bunch of guys. A basketball player, you the practice facility they bring, they bring all that stuff, right? We have everything, right? We bring all the stuff to the table. We could essentially bring the, shoot our own videos. Yeah. So, so we should be able to, after three or four years, if you ain't do something for us, we should be able to bounce. Being more marketable, if you do want to pursue the label route, you know, being if somebody like you is a great example. You have video skills, so you can right. put content regularly that's huge that helps them with marketing like the more you can provide value to them and say hey this is how i can make you money and these are all the skills and how i'm well-rounded to benefit you that's huge yeah and they're not going to sign you here's the thing i know no one unless you're a 16 year old genius right who's getting signed without some social media Mm -hmm. right so if you're so and and we're talking you know hundred thousand million people yeah right if i have a hundred thousand million people I'm, I'm trying to understand why am i going to you <laughs> exactly. you know what i mean like i'm yeah. not that greedy i, I i'm fine with my fifty thousand dollars a year you know what i mean because that's where you are right, right. so why am i going to you you're you going to me because you want to because you want to floss i mean that's basically what it is yeah but it's a business treat it if you treat it like any other business fine yeah because the beauty of what you're doing here is that you control your way and once you get into the label thing, I've been there. It's a whole different vibe. So for me, it'd have to be the best situation on the planet. Like I'd have to be like, ooh, I'd have to be somewhere. Of course, everybody has a thing, but I just don't like, like I said, I don't like the fact legally of the yeah. most things. Almost every record deal I've ever seen, all the options are on their part. That just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Also, the way that they pay you, where you get paid, you know, yeah. $100,000 here, 
but you 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 have to pay off your hundred thousand dollars worth. They're caking, so yeah. they could keep, they could make three million dollars before you paid off your deal. Like that's crazy. There's a lot of sketchy deals out there, man. I've heard some major horror stories. Most deals are sketchy. Almost yeah. every deal, ninety nine point nine point percent of deals are sketchy. I said, anybody listening, get a lawyer. <laughs> if you, it's not even just get a lawyer. Here's the other thing: get a lawyer, get a lawyer, a music lawyer, and then ask the lawyer. Make sure that the lawyer is not working for the label. Oh, that's really sketch. <laughs> hey, that's a very standard thing. Really? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's not just the label. You have to be like, make sure, have you, are you working? Are you currently working with the label or any subsidiary of the label? That's pretty wild. It happens though, man. It happens. Oh, uh, it happens. Yeah. So, you know, so that's, so I say indies, indies the way to go. It's just going to, you got to be patient. You know, and and that's what it is. And if it doesn't bump bump off, hey. yeah, for sure. What are what are some actionable steps people can take away listening to this that are wanting to grow, say, their online presence and and being an independent artist that's successful? Like, what are just a couple quick tips you could throw out? Just stay with it. I mean, I know it sounds corny, but just stay with it because I, I have a video that has five thousand views. Then I have a video that has sixty thousand views. Then I have a video that has 200 views, right? Yeah. You got, you just got to keep grinding. Mm-hmm. And eventually if you grind enough, you know, everything that I've seen, it just, it just takes time. You just got, it's a slow build. That's it. And just make the best content that you can be consistent with your content. Try to reach out to people, you know, with your content and also be honest with your content. Do what you want to do. Don't just sit there and do what, Oh, blah, blah, blah. is doing this. So I'm going to do that. You could see the strategies that people use. I'm I'm a fan of watching what people did. You should watch what the successful person does. I think that's important. So watch what's successful. Don't watch what a loser is doing, right? But at the same time, at the same time, do what you would interest you. People know that my beat design is what I want to do. Yeah. You know, we've got eight thousand subscribers, not tons of people, but it's been growing. You know, and some days, some videos resonate harder. Some videos don't come in and comment because you'd be surprised one or two people it's it, it's usually one or two people i've seen people who started the same way and they just kept grinding some people take longer but and just cry, also keep your content quality big. and then and then the same thing with the records you know when you put out a, a record i mean our record this our, this is our first album really you know, i've been involved in tons of work but this is my first album and yeah. you know we did it on our own to get to about forty thousand plays right you on. know and that's just Spotify. So all together, I think we're at a hundred thousand. If you add up Spotify, this one, this one. All right. So, and you consistently, consistently, consistent. I mean, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, man. But yeah. One quote that you had that I'd like to quote you on and from the, the Ableton article I've been referencing is you said, if I look back at my track and it's not the best, that's okay because it's real. Yeah. Just make stuff. That, I mean, I love that. I love that. Yeah, just just real. make stuff. That's good. Don't be scared to throw away stuff. Put something out. I know too many musicians who say they're musicians, but I've never heard anything they've done. <laughs> or, or it's not, or, you know, and I'll see them in events and they're like, hey, what's up? And they're like, hey, and I'm like, I haven't heard your record. Like, you know what I mean? You know, you, you're saying you're making a beat, but how come I haven't heard this beat? And you're just sitting on these tracks for 10 million years. Or you're sitting on some vocals for 10 years, you know, and, and not. There's been tracks I didn't release that I eventually did. And that was people's favorite song of mine. Yeah, I just just put out and just put out. I mean, what's the point? Yeah. You know, what I mean, if it's a hobby, that's cool. It's just for you. But if you if if it's not a hobby and it's something that you want to do seriously, I need to hear the records. You know, everybody does because yeah. you don't know what's hot a lot of times. You don't determine that. You know, the most important person is 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 the the end result is the 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 listener, the fan. That's the beauty of Instagram and YouTube. Like. You know, when you have 8,000 listeners or if like for me, you like, I know I can count on 400 people to watch that beat design or 300 people to watch that beat design. Right. Yeah. But like count on them. Right. Like I know they're going to watch that is that's who that is your ultimate person. Yeah. Not some guy behind the desk at a label, not Jay-Z. Yeah. Your ultimate person is the regular guy. So, so you're getting to them when you do that. And that regular guy is the guy who's going to give you the money, not the record company. And many people get when they try to, that's why some people want record deals because they want the money from them. 
but that's not who you want money from. <laughs> you're you're already reaching out to your person on YouTube. That's the guy. He's more important than the than the, the gatekeeper guy. He could keep you alive. It's kind of like Dave Chappelle saying, you know, I reached out to my boss. I reached out to you. Don't watch the show. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's the audience. That's your real boss. Like you love the shit out of them. And the more you love them, they love you back. And in the end of the day, that's what it's about, right? And that, and that I've always said that, you know, I'm like, oh, okay. There's, there's, you know, there's, you know, this group of people all together, maybe about 100,000 people. I mean, 100,000 plays. Let's say that's 10,000 people, right? Or, you know, or, or, or 5,000 people, those 5,000 people are like, Hey, they, they matter. Yeah. Right. More than, you know, anybody. Yeah. No, I love all the people listening right now. Like this one's for they're, you. They're, they're everything. The fan is the, the, the so-called fan or whatever, the, or the lover of your music or the lover of your idea. Yeah. Every, every musician should know that they're your ultimate goal. They matter. Yeah. Don't worry about the gatekeeper, man. They don't matter. The mm-hmm. gatekeeper the gatekeeper, you can override the gatekeeper with the fan because all the gatekeeper cares about is the fan. That's so real, man. And all and all and us musicians need to know that. Like, yeah, it, it's the fan. It's like it's you got 10 guys on uh, who watch your videos on Facebook. You got 10 fans and those 10 fans are the ultimate goal. Mm-hmm. All the money that these record companies pay is to get to that guy. That super got to double up. A super fan is what you want. Yeah, the, they tell fan. one other oh, person. That person tells another person. And that's it. And you just and you, yeah. yeah, and just and just and enjoy the ride on that way. That's right, man. I think that's a great way to wrap this up. I know we've gone way over time, but like, yeah. <laughs> it's been so good hanging with you. I appreciate. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was, it was lit. It was, lit. it was, lit. it was popping. No, it's good hanging. I hope I didn't go too long. No, never, man. I could probably sit here for about three hours, but I know we got stuff to do. Yeah, everybody does. Everybody got lives to go <laughs> on. I want to thank you guys for, for um, uh, you know, let me chop up and talk, uh, you know, Always. Ableton and tech and nerdy stuff. Yeah, Ableton gang, gang, gang. Gang, gang. That's what's up. Well, hey, man, it was good hanging with you. Maybe we'll do it again sometime in the near future. And Yeah, for- yeah, yeah. If you ever pass And don't forget to pass. check out, um, real quick, my yes. video, Dream- yeah, yeah, yeah. So Dream is Manifesto. Okay, the best place to find me is thomaspipermusic.com. And on my Instagram, which I think is just thomaspiper1 or Thomas Piper, I'm always there. Um, and on Bandcamp, Thomas Piper. And on Bandcamp, I have my album, but I also have my beat design. So you can check out my album and a beat design. And then beat design is on my YouTube channel. Just uh, you can type in Thomas Piper, Google Thomas Piper beat design, and you'll, you'll find me. And I'm there every Friday and I'm in the chat at 7.15. So we, the beat designs are short. They're only like seven minutes long. Quick, make a beat out. Right. That's Eastern yeah. time. Hmm? Eastern time, right? Yeah, Eastern time. EST, yeah. yeah. And um, Eastern time. And um, I go on the chat like 7.15. So you could chop it up with me in the chat like 7.15. And then um, and at 7.30, we watch the beat design real quick. And then we out and go off and go to your virtual parties. Or whatever, uh, go to check out my people's at Soul in the Horn, yeah, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what we do. So, and um, yeah, that's enough plugs. Yeah, dude. Well, uh, everybody listening right now, check out the links in the show notes. I'm going to include all the things that our, our friend Thomas just said. Also, shout out, congrats on Permission to Live. It's a great album. Um, Thank I you. Love, I love the single Dreamers Manifesto. It's very real in the times we're living in. Uh, appreciate you, man. Let's do this again sometime. Yeah, let's do this again. It was lit. Yo, everyone. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Big thanks to Thomas Piper for hanging out. Um, Wanted to remind you, if you want to be the first to know when new episodes come out, join the newsletter. I'll also send you cool updates and stuff and webinars and things that I'm doing. Go to liveproducersonline.com slash newsletter. Also join the Discord group. Would love to see you in that community. It's a great way to ask questions, to connect with other Ableton users and grow your skills. And yeah, so go to liveproducersonline.com slash discord for that. If you want to purchase Ableton Live 11 and you haven't done it yet, definitely do it. Worth it. There's a lot of cool features and updates in there. Um, Go to liveproducersonline.com slash buy Ableton. Be happy to hook you up. Save that piggy bank. And yeah, I will see you guys in the next episode. Please leave a great review, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And I will see you next time. Later.